And walking the streets of Hold Havana, you quickly see the beautiful architecture in the neighborhood. But at the same time, when visiting these homes, you quickly realize the quality of life enjoyed by these Cubans is a lot different than most Americans. We were welcomed into the 100-year-old home of the Oliveira family. Orlando's grandfather was a cook for the Bautista government and is himself a cook with a flair for rabbit and Cajun food. As Orlando took us through the dark corridors of his apartment house, we discovered having enough food was a serious concern. In these times that we're living now, it's very common to see the refrigerator almost empty. The few money that we can earn is just for food. While Orlando fixed us coffee, his best friend sat down to talk about life in Cuba. 30-year-old Omar has friends and family in America and wants to live in the U.S. someday. His life in Cuba is a series of odd jobs. Like most people, he graduated from high school, but what set him apart was his willingness to talk about his country. Omar had no reservations talking to us about Castro and the communist government. It hasn't taught me anything. It could, it could have a lot of good things, I don't know, for them, but for me it's nothing. In theory, under communism, everyone is equal. While access to food, health care, and medicine is available to all people, special privileges go to active and loyal members of the Communist Party. Is that fair? Is that justo? No. No, it's not fair. Why? Por qué? It is not fair because everyone must be equal. Fidel is a person that, is in, have, that has been in power for 42 years and always telling the Americans no, and he's going to continue like that. Do you like Fidel? No, I don't like Fidel. Why not? Because for me, no hecho nada. He hasn't done anything that convinced convince me as a citizen. No pensamos. Just a few hours earlier across town, Fidel was giving a speech and collapsed. The incident made international headlines, causing some to seriously question the immediate future of the country. But in short time, Fidel was on national television, assuring his people he was fine and still in control. But the speech drew little interest in this house from Orlando's girlfriend or the family dog, Coca. Many of the Cubans we talked to made a simple request, no politics. Omar says they may have feared punishment from the government for talking to American television, but not him, even though he too could get in trouble. Here, everything is possible, but it doesn't worry me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. Omar and his friends are big baseball fans, rooting for the New York Yankees, and even getting into a spirited discussion with our interpreter about the best team in Cuba. He's telling me that the best Cuban uh, baseball team is Industriales. I said that was Santiago. And he was also well aware of the games involving the Illinois teams. He knew that they were just coming and playing here in Cuba. He heard that on a sport program that we have on TV. Baseball is a welcome diversion to an otherwise difficult life. Their home is in general disrepair. They estimate it'll take a thousand dollars to renovate, but that's money very hard to come by. Most of the Cubans have no dollars. So your salary is paid in Cuban pesos. Salaries are not comparable with the work we, we do. So the problem is to find the money in order to eat. Because with Cuban pesos, you can't buy anything to eat. If you earn 148 Cuban pesos a month, it, it is about six dollars. And with six dollars, you go to any market and you can't buy anything. That's why you can't eat well. That's why it's very hard. And I was born in this system. I grew up in this system. I don't know capitalism. I've never been in a country like that. But I would like to know about that system in order to compare. It's not as if Omar doesn't know how to enterprise. As a way to make extra dollars, he displays black market cigars. 
These smokes probably came from the nearby cigar factory where several of his friends worked. Under U.S. embargo laws, we were able to bring back no more than $100 worth of Cuban goods, including cigars, but nothing from the black market. Despite the hardships, this is clearly a neighborhood where people know and care for each other, and the balcony is a perfect place to hang laundry, catch up on the latest gossip, and watch the world go by. Baby. Omar told us about all the people living across the alleyway and next door. I think he's retired now, and he works in a pizza parlor. A sense of community is one thing, but Omar longs for more. In Cuba, no tengo futuro. In Cuba there is no future for me. Mi, mi mayor deseo One of the biggest wishes I've ever had is to go to the United States, because uh, most of, uh, of, of my relatives live there. And once I arrive there, to work hard, to have a chance to study something and to learn something in order to have a, a higher personal development. Agriculture is a major industry in Cuba, with sugarcane, coffee and tobacco being the major crops. But at this small cooperative in Havana, lettuce is king. I mean, they grow 10 different crops here, but uh, uh, lettuce is the thing that's in most demand, so that's why they're growing it. Rafael Ferrer is the manager here. He has 27 men under his direction and 287 seed beds to watch. Perhaps the only concession to modern farming is a simple irrigation system. No tractors here, just a lot of hard work by hand. It's a farming on a scale not seen in America for decades. They have the equipment, they have the organic fertilizers, um, they have the soil that they need for the prod for to produce the crops. This small farm is located right in the heart of Havana. At another time, this plot of land was used for a different purpose. This site at one time uh, used to be a building site, and so a lot of the stuff you see is kind of the, the leftover materials from that. They have brought in other soils in to kind of help build it up. He doesn't think it's a, they're very tall, the raised seed beds, but uh, for crops, if you're going to grow a beet or a radish, um, you need a place for them to grow down. Rafael clearly remembers the food riots from the early 90s, but says the situation has changed. Yeah, yeah it says much, much, very much better now, very much better. See, see, see. The government is the general overseer of the small farm, but after certain quotas are met, the workers are allowed to split any excess profits. Depends on uh, the time of the year. Uh, at the end of the year, there's better crops, and they, they do better. This time of the year, you know, the crops aren't growing as well, so it's not as, as good. Cuba is one of the most literate nations in the world, and education is strongly valued. The critics will quickly point out any activity seen to be contrary to the goals of the revolution will be suppressed. One, two, three, Cuba, charge! Remember that abysmal ball field the girls played on that first day? That's the field the national softball team practices on outside of the school where most of Cuba's most promising athletes go to train and study. Atletas de clase mundial. From this place, many famous athletes have come out. Javier Sotomayor. Eh, varias veces en salto de altura world, y campeón olímpico. World champion and a, he was a, an Olympic champion in high jump. It's an academy similar to the United States Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, and the competitive spirit is clearly seen on the walls. But not all American competitors are seen in such an unfavorable light. Our most recognizable athlete is even revered in Cuba. Si tú puedes jugar basketball como Michael Jordan. ¿Sí? <laughs> This is not a representative school, but interesting nonetheless, especially some of the strength training exercises that are used instead of modern weight rooms. There are 1,100 students who live in dormitories here, including the 22-year-old Olympian we heard from earlier. It's a school for training, a lot of attention, good food. It's a great school. The school year is similar to our academic calendar, starting in September and wrapping up in mid-June. Class sizes average around 20 students per class, and the campus is located on the site of the 1991 Pan American Games. It's a way to develop the child and also a way to develop the whole, the whole country itself. The importance that sports has here keeps the kids and the town very united. 
He's called the Cuban Frank Sinatra. He does it his way at the Parisian nightclub in the National Hotel. When our Cuban adventure continues, he'll give us a tour of this Cuban landmark, and maybe he'll belt out a tune or two.